Welcome everybody to this presentation. Focus here is on using your Munsis data in the field. And what we've done is created this product called Munsis Field Sync over the last four or five years. And it connects and integrates with a mobile platform. So let's take a look. So Munsis Field Sync really is about the integration or making it easy to synchronize the data that you have in Munsis into field application you, where people can walk around with tablets or phones and make changes and take photos and that sort of thing on the data in the cloud. And we'll run through all the details of that. It's goal is to make it simple to achieve that, to do the administration. And that's what I'll be showing you how to set it up and how interaction works and how to use it so that you can really get information captured on various devices by a number of people and pull those straight back into your Munsis data, including photos. So very powerful, very useful tool. So this is what you're familiar with. Your picture of choice here doesn't really matter, but it's Munsis data in Oracle tables, special, and you editing the attributes in here. What we want to do is how do we get that to a mobile app, which I'll show you on the left here. So what we use is a product called Amigo Collect. You'll see at the top there, Amigo Collect is the app and it's from a company called Amigo Cloud. I'll have the URL at the end, but it's amigocloud.com. And if you look at the pictures on the left, I'm showing you, this is right off of my phone actually, a screenshot of what the map looks like. So Munsis data right on a mobile app like that. And then the form that goes with it. So if you're familiar with Munsis, you'll see these column names, et cetera, and even drop Downs, and I'll show you how we get that. But in essence, the app itself deals with the display of data and then all the bits, and I'll go through those and then drill down the forms and is really a very slick deployment of that. So let's take a look. Munsis Field Sync is really how do you go from what I got on the right to the left and then whatever's captured on the left in the mobile app, how do you get that back into Munsis and how do you control it and set it up and deal with it from there? So let's take a look. If we start with Munsis and the whole assumption here is that you have a whole bunch of Munsis data that you've been building out from various records and surveys and whatever for any number of features and that defines the columns and the lookups and the rules. And so you have essentially, let's call it your enterprise Munsis data schema. Munsis Field Sync is a server side application. So you'd install it once in your organization and from there you'd set up various services and it works from there. The first step is Munsis Field Sync includes tools for you to push your data from Munsis directly into the cloud on the Amiga Cloud site. What you do is set up a project and then with Munsis Field Sync, you can literally connect between the two. It'll connect to the Munsis database and to the cloud project, and you can select which columns and push those into the cloud. So now you've got a version of the Munsis data up there. When it does that, it automatically assigns an ID to both of them. It populates the Munsis schema, so it'll add a column literally called Amigo ID into each feature table you're going to use. It takes the GIDs and the unique identifiers from Munsis. And so we have an, a unique ID for both data sets. And the reason we do that is if you add something new in Munsis, it won't yet have cloud-based ID. If you add something new from the app, it won't yet have a GID. And so we need both so we can reconcile them. And that, that pair then becomes a unique combination. On the app side, the user will literally go to the app stores, Apple, Google, whatever, and then download the Amiga Collect app is what it's called from a company called Amiga Cloud. Look for a logo, so, sort of like that. It's a free trial. You can go in, download it, try it. But until you've actually got your own data and a project set up, et cetera, it's kind of limited to what you can do, but very, very nice to do that. So once you have the app, you can then connect to a project. So in Munsis Field Sync, we would then have already created that project and populated it with data. When you get invited to that project, anyone can go on the app store, install it, and they've got it on their phone. You then, when you log in to get the app, you use an email and that identifies you. On the Munsa side, in that project, we invite you to that project and you as a user in Amigo Collect, the next time you open the app, first of all, you'll get an email to say, hey, you've been invited to this project. But when you open the app, that project then becomes available for you to use in the app. And so that's kind of how you control who has access to your data. On the app itself, it can use a Bluetooth GPS. All the, the tablets and phones pretty much have a GPS, but it's not survey accurate. It's really more about keeping you on the right side of the road, but that's about it, somewhere on the road, and that's as close as you're gonna get. 
The the difference with a Bluetooth GPS is you can in fact get a GNSS Bluetooth connected device to your mobile device. And so that Bluetooth thing can be used. And you'll be then walk around in the field and you could then have, you know, basically foot accuracy survey data. When you're using a GPS, by the way, it's the same. It doesn't really matter whether you're using our stuff or anybody else's. The GPS unit, and I'm talking about the Bluetooth one, you do need to like stand in the same spot for about two minutes actually for the gps unit itself to triangulate from you know any number of satellites in the sky the usual problems of with between buildings etc are there what we found is actually using a really high res aerial allows the user to use the gps on the device to zoom to where you're standing close enough within 10 20 feet but also then to go in and use the high res aerial photo allows you to move things pretty precisely within the sort of a resolution you're going to get. But it's never going to be full-blown survey accurate unless you take the time and trouble to do that, just so you know. But it's going to be way more accurate than necessarily what you've done off of record plans and that sort of thing. So, yeah, optional GPS with a Bluetooth connection to the device. So going back then, if this person captures info, so they can edit attributes, they can move, literally edit geometry, move a point. So if this hydrant in this picture, for example, was not there on the app, in other words, in your data, it shows in a different position to where you have it on in the ground, then you could move it, literally click it and move it. And then also you can take photos and all of that stuff again gets uploaded to the cloud. And I'll talk about online and offline in a minute. But once you connect, then it'll go into the cloud. So now that information is in the cloud. And what Munster's Field Sync does is it is a listener. And the cloud here contains flags for change sets. And so if a change is made, it gets flagged. And the Munster's Field Sync listener goes and says, ah, I see there's been a change. And it can pull that down. Now, we don't recommend you do it real time because it becomes a challenge. I'll explain that why. What we recommend is you probably set it like once a day, nighttime when there's not a lot of traffic and you do a pull from the cloud and sync it back into the Munster's database. And I'll talk in detail about how that works. The reason you don't want to necessarily do it live real time is when you're doing it in the field, you could have any number of users in the field with the app. So it has a multi-user setup where you can have, you know, 10, 100, whatever folks. But every time one of those people makes a change, that change gets pushed to the cloud if they're working live online. Once again, I'll talk about online versus offline in a minute. If one person makes a change, then that change in the cloud gets propagated to all the rest of the 99 or whatever. And literally what happens is a user walking around in the field could spend a lot of time just waiting to get the updates that everyone else is making. And so that's kind of why you want to work offline so that you can make your changes and then sync it. It's also why you don't really want to live feed all the way to months because you're just going to get this continual trickle of stuff. And then it becomes a little complicated to deal with the conflicts if there are any and and we keep a log of those. It's probably better to do it once a day or once a week, depending on, on how much data is being captured, because then you can track it and control it. But anyway, Munster's Field Sync, you can schedule a task from the listener to actually go and check. What happens then is that data with the Munster's Field Sync will get inserted directly into the Munster's Spatial Table. It requires you have Munster's Lineage active on that spatial table, because that's why we're okay to just go and update your tables, because we've got Lineage going on. Also, we track whether someone in Munster's has actually edited that, and then we know that which one is newer of those and then you can come back and track it because there is now essentially two places where data can get edited. Munster says the master and so we just want to track those changes. There is in fact also a change table that Amigo Cloud keep. We download that from the cloud into a standard standalone Oracle table. They've all got the ID so we don't actually need the geometry. We just pull in who changed what, where and when and we link it to that Munster's feature and that way we can see exactly who changed it. The updates into Munsus through Munsus Field Sync is done with a user that we create called Field Sync. And then it just appears that one user made all of those changes. But then we connect it to the Amigo Cloud change table and we can actually get more resolution on exactly which user made which change on which feature. So that's kind of the whole thing right there. <laughs> Let's get into some of the details. So we call it a push. Munsus is the master. So you push your original data or once you set it up once, we then are only pushing changes and you push that into the cloud and then you can pull stuff back down. All of that automatically, this runs, you can set it up on a schedule, you can have it running automatically in the background. It's a service that's running on a server or connected to your servers and to the cloud. 
So once again, any device, you could run the Amiga Cloud stuff on the desktop or browser or iPad, iPhone, Android, etc. Tablets are a little better because they're larger format and if you have bigger fingers, a little easier to see out in the sunlight. But phone's very handy because you can carry it around. All of them, you can take photos, etc. The connected and disconnected, when you're using the app, the app itself absolutely accounts for and allows you to work in a disconnected mode, which I actually advise because it also saves bandwidth and time and allows you not to get interrupted by all the changes made by everyone else while your phone's trying to resync and then you can go and make your change. You can always turn it on and then resync. So usually if you've got a good signal, then you can go ahead and connect and it'll resync automatically and track those changes. And so I recommend you work offline and sync whenever you, you get a connection. You can just toggle it on and off in the app. So it's pretty slick. So this is sort of the agenda of this presentation. I'm gonna go through the setup in some detail. We'll look at using the mobile app. We'll look at just some of the tricks with the photos and how we deal with that with the Munsis Field Sync and then tracking changes. So setup, if you've used Munsis Management Console, this is a familiar territory and it's got your features listed. And so this is really a view of the features in your enterprise data schema. What we do then with Munsis Field Sync is we provide a simple little user interface. There's a lot of backend stuff, but the user interface allows you to say, go and link existing. So literally you can take, say I wanted to take these two Munsis features, or you could take a lot of them. I'm just picking two to make it easy. And so it looks fairly simple over here. You select those two and you say link existing, and now they, connect and what we'll do then is we will create a project id in amigo cloud and a data set id now obviously you would have had to have set up your connection to that with the admin login to amigo cloud but that's all stuff that we can set up so pretty simple link existing you select the tables and if it finds a corresponding column in amigo cloud so if you're using an existing project it'll use those if it's the first time out then it literally takes all the columns in those tables and pushes them and automatically creates that there are a couple of tools for control and config you can toggle status for example you can literally go and say it's not active yes or no you can remove stuff you can set coordinate systems etc but point being you can then push the data straight into the cloud from your Munsis table. You don't have to do anything. We know the geometry types, we know the column types, we know the coordinate systems. The data in the cloud is in WGS 84, so Munsis is automatically going to push from your Munsis schema's coordinate system into that, add sufficient decimals to make sure you get the required accuracy. And so that's kind of how you just do the config, that's set up. Let's just look a little bit before I get into the additional details. So what does it actually look like from a user's perspective? I'm just going to run through a couple of examples and screenshots. This is the app literally on, on a phone. And so you'll notice the symbology is a little simpler and you want that actually so that it's easy to see which ones. The dots in this case was poles and the reds were signage. And if there's a sign on the pole that is in poor condition, it gets flagged as red. And so that's why you're seeing different things there. But the moment you touch anything on the screen, it pops up a form. Now, as part of the setup, we've taken automatically the columns in Munsis. So if you've used Munsis Water, for example, you'll know these are standard columns there. And what we've done is created this form automatically. We go Cloud has a pretty good interactive form creator, but you really don't want to spend your life creating tons and tons of forms when the definition is already set up in, say, the Munsis database. So we automatically do that. We automatically will put in the lookup tables from Munsis, push them into the cloud and have them there. So making it easy for you to set it up, literally kind of push button to set up because you are setting up a multi-tiered cloud-based interaction with an app. This is not the easiest thing if you didn't have it automated like Munsis Field Sync does. In the app itself, the user has a couple of icons, probably easier to look at them on the left. You can get info, you can add new stuff, you can turn on and off the background. So the picture on the right has got the satellite. This is open street map. So there's standard backgrounds. You can use a custom uh, high-res aerial photo too, which is really good. You can turn on and off layers and there's a menu there at the top left where you can drop down for settings. If you go to that menu, for example, that's where you turn on and off the internal GPS if it was available, offline mode, etc. that sort of thing. So in sort of a listing, Munsis Field Sync allows you to start the listener, obviously, and it'll track anything you've set to being active for yes, 
any and all of those features. If it's the beginning master state, it'll actually push that data into the cloud. If you've already configured it and there's data in the cloud, the listener just stays there as an active thread and tracks any edits from Amigo Cloud, and then you can schedule that thread as well. You can push new data. So sometimes you want to then kind of consolidate. So you get all the cloud changes down and you push them back up to Amiga Cloud and set it back to sort of a base zero since the last push. So you kind of always work in the circular fashion so that Munsus remains as the master. You get a list of conflicts and that gets pushed into a table in Oracle on the Munsus schema so that you can kind of work through them GID by GID and see. Because, you know, Somebody might have edited in Munsis as well as someone through the app in the field. And this will then highlight it and say, well, which one do you want? And there's different ways of, of doing it auto or doing it manual and things like that. So typically you can control, you know, who's, do, who's doing what, but it's better to have those changes because if someone's been in the field and identified existing data that's on the map and a change to it or added something new, then that's great information. You can pull all listened data from Amiga Cloud. So this is then a pull back down update and you can push everything in Munsis backup. So if Munsis has made a change, the push and pull are, they do what we call a delta. In other words, they only do the changed stuff. So it goes quite quick. So the initial update can be, you know, if you've got thousands and thousands, you know, tens of thousands of assets that you're pushing up, that, that takes a little while. But after that, it works pretty efficiently because you're just doing the deltas. We do have a validate to just to check that nothing gets out of sync between the IDs of them. Of course, we've accounted for the GID that Munsis has. And then when you push stuff into the cloud for Amigo Cloud, it gets a, what they call an Amigo ID. And we literally add a column into every feature that you're tracking on Munsis. And then obviously in the cloud, Amigo Cloud has a GID column for that feature. And we track those two together because if somebody adds something through the app, it'll get an Amigo ID but it won't yet be in Munsis, so it can't have a GID yet. So then we know that and we assign it when we update it and vice versa. If somebody adds something in Munsis, it still doesn't have an Amigo ID, but when we upload it, we take care of that. So we deal with that bi-directional synchronization. So let's take a look at using the app itself. So now you go, as I said, so this is what the icon looks like. And this is one of my phones, I guess. The icon looks like that. You get it on the Play Store, install it, set it up. So these are just a view of what the user looks like. So this is a project that we did and it was very colorful, but you can see it has tons and tons of utilities there and you can turn them on. So what the user has done now is gone to a project. These are the features in that project. Check the box, which ones you want to download and it syncs and you can see there's a lot of stuff. Also, we used very verbose symbology, <laughs> thick lines and big dots. The, the white and the yellow background, by the way, are thematic. Yellow being, no, it hasn't been updated through, checked in the field, white outlines. If you see those blue dots, the little white outline, anything that has been checked or visited, we automatically toggle from the status, we toggle the background to white and yellow. There's one technique, it makes for a colorful map, can be useful. So here, if we go and we click on one one of these features, all of this data came out of Munsis. And in Munsis Field Sync, push that straight up there and created the form. So if you click on, say, that gravity pipe, you'll see those columns are Munsis columns. That data came out of Munsis. And you'll see options to take a photo, to view photos. You'll see options to edit geometry. And this is pretty nice. And this is actually a detailed forms. You can enter things like, you know, the date or whatever. So you see at the top there, it's updating there. That's doing a sync. So this person was obviously live. So let's go one more and look at another instance. So here, it starts off the same, but it's much more detailed. This is the projects and the settings. So if you go to that menu, you can go to projects. So I'm admin, so I've got a ton of projects. So you would only have one or two, but you can set a project to have like all of your utilities, or you can have specific ones for say water or storm or whatever. This is a project where this was designed to go and capture leaks. So there's two different ways you can use these apps. One is just to show your existing data and to go and update it. The other one's to capture new stuff, things like leaks or work needed or graffiti or anything you want. But what you're gonna do as a user is come in here and check on the features within that project. And then what I'm doing is pinch zooming. So those funny little gray dots you see there, by the way, I set my phone to show where my fingers are touching, just so you can see what that is just for presentation purposes. But actually when you're using this, you don't do a whole lot of that zooming, even though that's what I'm doing now. Because you would use this icon, the, the the GPS icon, whether that's on your phone or whether it's the Bluetooth one. When you hit that, it zooms to where you are. So literally, as you 
walk around, you can easily just zoom to where you are and you don't have to do all that consuming and everything else. So just so you know, you can automatically do that. It'll put your GPS position in the middle of the screen and zoom in to a predefined zoom state. So anyway, but for now, obviously I'm, I'm not out in, the, in this area. It's an arid area in California. And so this person is out there and they're just trying to put in something. When you hit plus down the bottom, that means you can add new stuff. It can either be tracking, that's literally where you walk a line and it'll draw the line on the map. It doesn't really make very straight lines unless you're using a good GPS, but anyway. The other thing it'll do is it offers you then all of the feature types where you're allowed to add features and you can go choose it. So if I wanted to add a water node, I could do that, or a leak, I could add a point or a water pipe. So it literally knows which data set to go put those in. So say I want to add something, I hit the plus, I go in, I pick the feature, and then now I can go on the screen, you'll see the little white dot appear. And that white dot, I can select it with my finger literally and drag it to where I want it to be. It zoomed itself to where the, the GPS would have had it. And then once you hit the checkbox, it pops up the form and now you start filling in stuff. So you see drop downs. Uh, they look slightly different on Apple. This is on Android, but it doesn't really matter. And then it automatically puts in your name, creates an ID, takes the date. So yeah, you can see 2018. And then you can save or discard the moment you try and go away and we'll add that point onto the map. I'll show you just a few examples here. This is different ones of different things. So you can kind of get a feel for where we're at here. So if you hit the settings off of the main menu, you can see things like the synchronization, the photo size. I actually recommend you use about a two megapixel photo because they get huge and the file size exponentially increases and pretty much uh, you know, anyway, that, that's a decision you can make. There's a whole lot of different things to that you can set there and that's kind of really useful. So let's go to a different project here. I'm going to go in and pick a, a project here. And when you click on a project, it, it will do loading. So you kind of want to do this when you've got a good connection. Here's one for just specific checking of backflow devices. So water backflow devices, there's a requirement that they get inspected and these forms are going to be filled in and all sorts of stuff. So here we took the Munsters data for backflow devices, loaded it into this as a single project and then basically they got a contract to walk around and go look at all of these things and check that the photos are correct and that it's been there. So once again, you could use your GPS and zoom to where you are or you can zoom in like I am to go find it. Those numbers, by the way, are the node IDs. So, and let me actually just go back there. So the, what they did there was the bottom right icon got clicked and that then allowed the user to select which background to show. There it is right there. So they've got their own custom image, which you can add, or you can get, you know, basically satellite or whatever. And so they've got, if we select that custom one, we get a much higher res image. So now we can actually zoom in and see shadows of poles and things and even see the equipment there. So pretty neat. And then of course you can go in and say, and, and just put your finger right on that green dot like that. And that'll then go and do a read and you've zoomed right tight here. So it'll go in, read the data and pop it in. So this is what data is out of Munsters, but it's coming then from the cloud or from if you're working, they probably were working online. So it did a read there, but you'll see this has got the backflow device information on it, all of that. And then they can even view the photos that were previously checked. So here's that photo. So on the, the device, they can check, yeah, this is the one, it's the right thing, uh, we're good and or they can take another photo etc all right so let's go on then to a additional example so here is borough of lincoln park so this is a water district we just set up and then look at their project all we've done there is water pipes and nodes they actually do a bunch of other things and so this month this data was taken originally from a wall map and a, and a couple of cad files and then pretty much put in a mobile app and let various staff folks go and double check. We've got things in the right place, et cetera. One of those exercises was well, the Valve exercising program. So as it gets exercised, so this data then in Munsters and in Lighten actually, they can turn on the off the shelf background image, not that great in this instance, but if you click on something, so what's happening here is the person clicked they were zoomed fairly wide out. And when you click on it, you got big fingers, but you touch multiple features. And what they were looking at is trying to get to the hydrant. So they would need to choose this one to see the data on it. So what it's doing is this is essentially what you selected, if you will. So picked a few pipes, picked up some survey data and a junction, 
and a hydrant. So if you want the hydrant, then you'd go in this list, click on the hydrant, and so here you go. This is what they had out of Munsis, and you'll notice um, there's information like the number of turns, the open or closed normally, and condition, good or bad, etc. So that's just showing the, the satellite image. So that imagery is available from the get-go. So let's go on a bit further. So that's kind of how you'd use the app. That's how you update that info and you sync it back into Munsis. So let's look at the photos because that's something you don't necessarily have on your desktop apps, but for the mobile app, really useful to add photos and to set them up automatically so they, they link. And what we're doing then is we're setting up a photo sync table in Oracle that Munsis Field Sync is gonna push the details of this is the ID of the feature and this is the name of the photo and then in enlighten and you're going to create a one-to-many link on a, a table and you can drill down let me show you photo sync is actually also a process that comes with munces field sync we have a separate thing for photos typically we kind of do the photos definitely on a scheduled basis either daily or weekly that takes a little while and what photo sync does is you can set up that service you can schedule it it runs in the background automatically no problem you can schedule but it creates thumbnails of the photos i'll show you why when we look at enlighten for example as well as the original photo but it automatically configures the path and folders so you can go in and set it for example if you were doing backflow devices you could have a folder somewhere on a server where you put the backflow devices versus water nodes versus you know i don't know gas or sewer or whatever you can have each different feature photos going to a different location for example and then automatically creates the thumbnail so let's take a look at that so starting here this is that same lincoln park when we clicked on that this is the munces data so this is valve 219 and you'll see in munces it had this information for 219 and then we've added these columns so that munces field sync can push the data from the field and so this was the operator of the water valve exercising done in 2019 by this person and they entered cross street and the node size. But these ones are interesting in as much as I'll show you them in Lighten in the tooltip. But the number of turns, normally open condition good. So, and then actually further down, we've, we've got you know, the name of the photo and then the mega ID and all of that. So going to Enlighten, this is Borough of Lincoln Park. So same thing you saw in Munces would be this area i believe here and so let me go in and, and zoom to that so 219 is right there and so what we've got then is as i move my mouse over it there's the tooltip and you'll see it's got 219 the open close good whatever and if i go into this guy i can load the real photo so there's the actual photo they took with their phone and you can see the two megapixels, not a bad photo, but, uh, and so we go with that. But then we go back to Enlighten, you can see literally most of the valves they've got, they've got another picture there. I think they did the main valves. I don't think they did the hydrant valves. Oh, there we go, did do hydrant valve. And so they walk through and then we can map which ones have been done, which ones haven't been done. Uh, we can theme them, but basically now all of a sudden, so there's one that hasn't been done. And there's one that has, so off you go and undo it. But those things just appear. This is the thumbnail I was talking about. And so when you've done a field sync, all of a sudden these are just on your map straight up. If you configure it like that, of course, you've gone into the tooltip, put in the URL, and then called the photo name from that particular folder, etc. And you've set that all up. But you can fairly easily keep it straight up so that each feature type has its own folder and you can you can go from there. So let's talk a little bit about tracking changes because it's kind of scary just throwing your data out there and then having it pushed automatically straight back into your database from the mobile app. But we lit literally are doing transaction tracking on both sides. On Munza's side, you need Lineage to be able to use the tracking changes from the mobile app and through Munza's field sync. So it has to have Lineage active. So that means in Munza's, we know exactly which column's been changed, who changed it, on which feature, and we actually store a history of it. If it was deleted, we've got a history of the deleted record. If it was updated, we know what was updated when. On the Amigo Cloud, they're doing much the same stuff, but what we're doing is taking the records there, the change log that they have in the cloud, and we're pulling it into an AC record history table on the Munces side. And I think I have an example of that. Yeah, so there's a few columns we add, like the AC photos would have the 
Amigo ID, uh, they look, they use it for the Amigo ID, they use a GUID, uh, it's a super long number, but it's unique and automatically generates. And you can see on this one, there's two photos, same ID, okay? Same data set, so they're probably a water node. I'll talk about data set IDs. It's kind of like a MUN ID, it's the internal feature ID. We add English to it later. <laughs> but the record IDs, you'll see these two are the same. So two pictures on the same thing. And typically that's what this organization actually standardized on any feature. They, they'll take a far away and a close up basically of everything. So there's usually two pictures. So that's why you're seeing most of them have a pair and the person's obviously doing their job well. And then in the record history, we know the data set ID, we know the date change, the date type, who changed it, and their first name, last name, et cetera. We track all of that. So we pull this into Oracle. So it's not sitting in the cloud anymore. And we just continually update that with every change. We continue to build this up. So you've got a long standing history on that. You can see if they added like the photos, this is the type of change is going to be an insert, an updated delete, or an update insert attachment. Okay. So so there's those files. You can then take it once you've got it in Munsys, you can do this sort of thing. And in fact, once again, this is a backup slide. I can show you the real thing. So this is Power BI pointing at that table. So here's the live Power BI. And it's better live in as much as so these guys had one, two, three, four, five, six people who did, let's see a few thousand changes and the timeline actually there was this was from august last year to end of february middle of february this year so in six months or so this this is pretty significant data quality because if somebody's been standing right next to something and took a photo or made an update then you know a lot of photos but these are all updates so you can see the type of change that's been done very little inserted quite a lot of updates done on the water nodes, done on water pipes, done on uh, sewer nodes, etc. So you'll see that there. And then of course here you can drill down and go and look at, at any particular person. So let's go in and basically just select one of these people. And so you'll see this person who's done 300 of them change the scale. So it looks like a lot, but it's only the 300. So not, not this person who's an overachiever. And yes, the names have been changed for the safety of all parties. And so that's basically just a drill down for all of that. And that applies. So that's all changes. This is by user. So now we can see which users did the most for water, sewer, etc. And then monthly, we can see which you what each of the users did where and when. So you can you know kind of pick that out so you can go in and say okay well was somebody consistently working from you know so as i said from august through to it's just into february you know somebody being consistent so if i go in let's you can play a few games on these this person has obviously realized there's a deadline so probably either they were obviously doing other things or they may this might be the procrastinator part of the equation where all of a sudden they realize they got to get on and do things Whereas if we go to to this person, well, they kind of got started and then they've done a serious set of, of hard work here, which is kind of useful and their numbers are off the charts compared to anybody else. So hopefully that's good data. This person's, you know, slow and steady. And so we're just drilling down through data. You also, you know, on the Power BI, you can set a slicer and you can say, well, hang on, let's actually restrict the timing on this to you know the time period so maybe we're only interested in what happened in the month of december right so we can go in here and, and say okay let's get to 12 uh 22 so we just slide it all the way along forever and get it right there so there's what happened in december for all users etc so you get the picture and that's kind of the final cherry on top for getting the data into the system. It basically, Munsis FieldSync is a product that we install on the server side, and then each user would need to have the app. I did put in the AmigoCloud.com if you want to go and look at that app. So each user purchases an app, and essentially you can go right there and buy a standalone app. But setting up these mobile forms and you have to actually author the look and feel of the data inside of Amigo Cloud. And let me actually just pull up one of these guys. You, you actually author what these lines look like and use simple symbologies and things that are big enough to click on. Otherwise it drives you nuts. And so sometimes you'll see, we'll put a specific ID there so that you, people can identify the segments and stuff like that. But in the setup with Munsters Field Sync, it's, as I said, a server side a set of services that run, you install it, configure it, but it's the go-between and the brains of pulling and pushing data, and it does a lot of heavy lifting. 
on the app side, each user can go to the amigocloud.com and go and purchase and buy that. But what you need to do then is we need to set up that project for you. And so Open Spatial has an alliance has had for years with Amigo Cloud. And so you can get that license through us, in which case when we set up that project, it automatically is tracking who's doing what. And so we offer support services around that as well. And then if you buy the app through us, we kind of batch it. So you can do it on a monthly or an annual basis. So if there's a specific set of surveys you want to do, you can try it and run for you know, three months, one month, a year, or whatever, and then you can add or remove users if you buy it on a monthly basis, for example. So that's it. Any questions? Let me know. If you want further information, obviously, openspatial.com. Thanks for your time. We'll stop right there and appreciate your time. Thank you very much.